So I'm actually going to admit that the work that I'll be presenting today is not work that I originally collected the data for. So I am I'm the conduit for the information you're going to get, but I did not collect this in the first place. So I don't want to take credit for all the hard work that went into collecting these guys. We're going to talk today about deepwater sculpin, which are actually one of the more common uh, prey fish in Lake Ontario after alewife, right? So we know that alewife dominate, but after alewife, deepwater sculpin actually turn out matter a lot now. And I've kind of given away in the, the title here what we're going to be talking about. We're actually also going to be spending a lot of time uh, relating deep water sculpin to mysis because it turns out mysis are really important to them. So deep water sculpin are this leftover species basically. This is a species that was at the edge of the ice sheet and as the ice sheet retreated deep water sculpin by and large went extinct but in a few places where there were uh, cold water habitats that they could retreat into, deep water sculpin persisted. So you find those kind of things uh, in, in uh, just a few lakes uh, throughout North America. Uh, this is a good example of what deep water sculpin look like. They are considerably different than what we typically think of as a sculpin because we have a different group of sculpin, the slimy sculpin, uh, model sculpin kind of things that we find in streams. So they're usually very easy to, to differentiate. And here is a great example of that retreat with the glacier, right? So the glacial sheets came down all over uh, North America, and you can see as these glacial sheets retreated, deep water sculpins followed that back up and then were trapped and left behind basically so that they couldn't get off the bus um, and they got stuck in these little places as they went back. But actually what's interesting about deep water sculpin is, it, it, in addition to just the fact that they're kind of a cool thing, is that they're very closely related to this other uh, species of sculpin called a four-horned sculpin. In fact, they were listed as a subspecies at one point. And the four-horned sculpin have these awesome bumps, sort of hornish, uh, rounded lumps on top of their head that appears to be related to bird predation. And deep water sculpin, since they now live at the bottom of lakes, do not deal with bird predation regularly, and so they don't have those big humps left behind on their head. But those four horned sculpin are actually circumpolar, right? They're all over the, the uh, northern uh, sort of Arctic uh, waters, and, and so those are the, that's the species that gave rise to the species we have now, which is kind of a cool uh, leftover. For Lake Ontario, so I, you can see here the distribution of deep water sculpins includes all of the Great Lakes, and while that's technically true, there really aren't any, and as far as we know right now, really aren't any in Lake Erie, and for Lake Ontario, they were probably extirpated by the 1970s, or probably even before that. It's hard to evaluate these kind of things because we don't necessarily have a great index of deep water sculpin abundance through time. They're really hard to catch, they're found in deep water, uh, and we don't have a necessarily a, a targeted fishery for them. So we don't necessarily know when their numbers are, are going up or down. But we do have lots of deep water sculpin now, and we have all sorts of sizes. And, and uh, 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 Brian and Wydell has done a lot of work uh, in addition to other members, but uh, published a paper showing uh, some of that size distribution and recovery of those animals in the, in the deep water environment. So what am I, what's actually out there and how deep are deep water sculpin? Well, if you're in the near shore area, uh, what we traditionally have were slimy sculpin. Now we have round goby, but we do occasionally still catch slimy sculpin. And that's what this series of dots and lines connecting them is. And so you can think of this just as the proportion of sculpin. If you're all the way up here at the top, that's 100% of the sculpin that we capture are that thing here, a slimy sculpin. If you're down here at the bottom, it means you, that we're not that the entire proportion uh, is zero percent of that sculpin. So when we're in near shore, so when the trawl depth is anything less than let's say 80 or 100 meters, it's basically all slimy sculpin in that case, or round gobies, but I'm not showing you in that in this uh, environment. If you get anywhere deeper than that, right, and you can really start to see that at, at about 130, uh, that, that, that proportion switches almost entirely to deep waters, you can see that deep waters dominate as soon as you get into the deep waters. And the other thing that you can see is these uh, uh, triangles right here are showing the total number of sculpins that I'm reporting for that. So the proportion is interesting, but we also want the, the number of sculpins you can see, at least for right now. We don't have very many sculpins in that, uh, in, in that in the, the shallower waters, but as you get into these deeper waters, you see the number of sculpins actually increases to over 100 uh, in that case for these captures. So there can be a lot of sculpins out there, but once you get that deep, it's all deep waters basically. So who cares about deep waters? Uh, besides the fact that these are really interesting fish, I mentioned some of the cool things about them being a glacial, glacial relic or related to these, these more inland or these more nearshore fish. Uh, deep waters actually are a big prey fish component of uh, traditionally what we're in Lake Ontario. So 
for things like lake trout and also probably for vermin. These are probably relatively important prey items. Whether that continues to be the case or not, uh, we can talk about, but they, they were at one time very important. They do diversify the prey fish base as well. So although alewife are really, really important in the Great Lakes, it's also really, really nice to not have all your eggs in one basket, one alewife basket to diversify your prey base so that there's opportunities out there for sports fish to, to you know, feed on different items. And then the other important thing is that they reestablish native energy pathways, right? So pathways of energy being passed between different organisms. This was one of those pathways, the passage of materials to the deep water sculpin up into these very high trophic levels like Lake Trump. And then from to get to a deep water sculpin, so I mentioned we just I just mentioned energy pathways, and I've talked about sports fish, but we don't just make deep water sculpin out of air. What actually deep water sculpin are built out of is, uh, or traditionally have been, is dipariah and mysis. Dipariah, if you don't know, are an amphipod. Mysis are a tiny shrimp that lived out, and both of these uh, live fairly deep in the, in the in all of the Great Lakes, or have until recently. Dipariah is not doing terribly well uh, by and large. But what you can see is this is a proportion of dipariah and proportion of mysis in the in the diets of deep water sculpin. You can see that they they are strongly related, right? So animals with lots of mysis do not have dipariah. Animals with dipariah do not have lots of mysis. The other thing that you should note is that these are really high values. So you can have up to 80 or more percent of your diet be composed of dipariah or mysis. So in that case, these animals are really dependent on those two groups of uh, organisms. And so, like I just mentioned, here's a picture. Here's a dipariah. Or he got a, here's a dipariah and here's a mycid. And the problem is that, of course, dipariah throughout the lakes have largely collapsed. Why that has occurred, we're not entirely sure. Uh, various hypotheses have floated for that. But that means that, by and large, mysis are the energy pathway that are available now to deep water sculpin. So is that what we see in Lake Ontario? So are they entirely dependent on mysis? So to get, it, to get at this problem, it's relatively straightforward, right? We can do a couple different things. The things that I'm going to show you today are we looked at a lot of duck content, and we looked at the stable isotopes of deep water sculpin to answer the question, what does deep water sculpin depend on? And these materials are actually collected from uh, 2009 to 2011. And we used preserved guts, and then we did uh, isotopes in 2013, and looked at 13C and 15N. So I'm going to show you this graph's a little complicated, so let me walk you through it before you uh, alert me to the fact that you should not present this much data simultaneously. There's two things going on here. Uh, I'm also going to give you a bit of a teaser in this as well. I've broken the sculpins into two groups. There's going to be a small group of sculpins, so sculpins. Uh, that are under 60 millimeters, those will be your small ones. It'll be a large group of sculpins, that's everything larger than 60 millimeters. The large ones here are on that right, they're the light gray. The small sculpins are dark, um, and they're on the, the left in all cases. I've broken this out into spring, summer, and fall, and then frequency of occurrence, and then I've tried to make these really, really big. They're identical, right? So if you read one, you've seen them all. But uh, these are the prey items that we found in the gut contest. And what you can tell right away is what matters to sculpins. Boom, it's mysis, uh, mysis, mysis, mysis. But I will make the, the little note here that yes, mysis matter, and mysis are all that matter when you're a big sculpin, as far as you can tell from the gut frequency content. But small sculpins actually have other stuff in them. It's not <coughs> just mysis, they also eat some other stuff. So large sculpins are absolutely linked to mysis. They, that is something that they need to survive. Small animals also are very strongly linked to mysis, but there's some other stuff going on there as well. Oh, and the last thing, I'll just go back and mention, the last thing you can see here is that seasonality is not really that important for anything. The small animals are maybe, there's some seasonality to what's available, but they're eating uh, a lot of, the, they're eating just probably what's available in the environment. The large mysis, it does not matter because it's all mysis all the time. The other thing that we did was we had uh, people measure the size of uh, uh, items within the, the <coughs> context. So we have lots of good information on the size of the sculpin and then the prey item size so we can get into some size selectivity. And what I want to show you is uh, that break point again. So why we decided to go with that 60 millimeters. What you can see here is right around 60 or 50 millimeters, there's a real shelf. Uh, you, these animals. Uh, here are really going from uh, an environment where they can eat, or they, I should say going from a, a lifestyle where they're eating maybe a variety of different items, to they are really focusing in on about 15 millimeter mysids, like 
really want to hammer those mice. But they either aren't capable of capturing them, which is probably the most likely case, uh, or they're not able to, to get uh, mice uh, of that size when they're smaller, right? At least from some of this stuff right here. Uh, the other thing is that they're eating um, ostracods when they're smaller, but you can see that those don't exist anymore. And then the other thing I will say is that we do have diaphoria occasionally in deep water sculpin. So if you're looking for diaphoria, the easiest way to do that is with an animal that spends its life looking for diaphoria. So you may want to open up a lot of deep water sculpins if you want to know if there are any diaphoria still on the bottom. But anyway, so uh, what, and again, the same message here that I showed you before, what really, really matters to deep water sculpins, especially large uh, deep waters, is mices. And they eat all of them, right? They eat a lot of mices, and they really like this size band right here in the 15 millimeter range. They do also eat some other bottom stuff, like uh, chironomids, maybe some terrestrial insects that make it down, but by and large, it's all mices. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about the ice tip. So we looked at the gut content. Gut content is a great tool. It gives you up to the minute information, right? It's an instantaneous look at what's in the animal's uh, diet. It doesn't necessarily tell you what the animal is using to build its body, only what it's consuming, right? There's all sorts of biases associated with gut content. That's especially true when you're dealing with different animals that are being consumed that have different levels of digestive efficiency, right? So if an animal is really hard to digest versus an animal is really easy to digest, it's really hard to know how, what proportion of that is in the diet just based on gut content alone, because it may or may not be in the diet long enough for you to determine that. So one way to get around some of those issues of gut content is to look at things like stable isotopes. And stable isotopes vary in the natural world, and that's a really useful thing because you are what you eat, so the isotopes that you consume, if they vary in the natural world that's around you, will be reflected in you in a variety of different ways. And so isotopes do something a little bit different. They give you the long-term running average as opposed to the instantaneous look at something. So they, they, that's the advantage they hold over that. And then I did mention that you are what you eat, but that's not entirely true. You are what you eat, plus or minus a value and there's a little bit of slop around that value too. So this is a good example here on the left of what's going on. Let's see if I have my what if you are what you eat, so if we imagine a really simple food chain where these guys are eating these and these guys are eating these and these guys are eating these, you move over and up uh, relative to some proportion from what you eat. Okay, and that's called fractionation. And in a 2D world it's at it's at sort of an angle, right? So there's some amount of uh, linear movement that you have along that. <coughs> But the point of it being that you are predictably uh, different from your food source. So you might not look exactly like your food source, but I can predict what you should look like relative to that. And then there's plenty of isotopes out there that we can look at. For most studies, it's a 13C and a 15N, or I should say a carbon and nitrogen world. But there are other isotopes that you can examine. But for today, we're just going to talk about carbon and nitrogen. The other element that I will add to isotopes is isotopes are a sort of a promise from heaven, right? These are going to tell you what these things have eaten for a long time. But isotopes also come with the caveat that they are, they are modified in the body through metabolic processes. So if there's a process that results in modification in the body that will not then reflect food, you have to be careful. And one of those processes is the making of lipids in an animal's body. An animal is making lipids out of itself, right? So it's making lipids out of materials within its body. So the starting material for the animal is animal. And so lipids don't look like the food. They look like modified food in the animal converted to something else. And so if you incorporate those into your isotope measurements, you run into some issues uh, with, with understanding what's going on. So you can tell that deep water sculpin can be really fatty, right? So they can be really strong effects on 13C. Lipids don't matter in, uh, for nitrogen because there isn't any nitrogen in lipid. And then for the purposes today, a carbon to nitrogen ratio, which is a rough measure of how much lipid is in the body, because it's, it's a ratio of carbon to nitrogen in it. The source material of 3.5 is approximately protein. It turns out 3.5 is really close to what amino acids are. And when you do that, so when you put carbon and nitrogen down here and 13C on the left axis, well, you don't, I don't need to necessarily have you understand this relationship. All you need to know is the fact that 13C is predicted by carbon and nitrogen means that 13C in deep water sculpin is a product of both their food and then as they get higher in lipid, also of lipid. So you have to be really careful about just interpreting it directly. 
And all, the other thing you need to know is that all deep water sculpin, regardless of what size they are for the ones that we measure, we don't measure large ones, are explained basically at that confluence of the, where they intercept of 3.5 in that linear line. Is. That's the average value that all animals have. So that makes it really easy, right? Because all, the, all of them have the same value, basically. And if you plot them out against things like mysis, I've also got some slimy sculpin here. So here's mysis, and here's deep water sculpin. What I want you to, to take away from that is that uh, deep water sculpin are really tightly packed in here. So here's, a, here's a, a, a nitrogen axis and a carbon axis, and this I've done lipid corrected now. Deep water sculpin are really, really tightly packed in there, but mysis are spread all over the place. So while deep water sculpin do eat a lot of mysis, they are not necessarily eating every available mysid type out there. They seem to be homing in on a certain brand of mysids. And they're not located squarely in the middle or around the middle of the, of the mycid pool. They're located above that and sort of at the fringe. So they're probably eating a specific group and probably those, that, those mices that tend to be a higher trophic level. So those are probably animals that are feeding on things, more things like zooplankton, which is, which is interesting in and of itself. And if you look at deep water sculpin compared to slimy sculpin, this shouldn't be a surprise either. Slimy sculpin, it turns out, aren't as great at catching mice as deep water sculpin. And so deep water sculpin are very similar to slimy sculpin in the isotope world, but they're slightly higher. So they're probably slightly better at getting those mice. And then the last thing is this little guy down here, which is a deep water sculpin, which makes no sense, it turned out, was the smallest deep water sculpin that we collected. And that animal is probably showing the pelagic signature. So we are getting animals right as they get to the bottom. And those isotopes are telling you that they are just turning over and becoming uh, that benthic pathway after having uh, been on a more uh, pelagic pathway for their lives. OK, so deep water sculpin depend on mices, but the small ones do use other stuff. right? They are able, and they probably can't depend on the very large ones when they're small. The diets are pretty stable through time and I didn't show you, but and location, so it's mice, it's everywhere all the time for everybody, uh, except for the little ones, which also get some other stuff. And then stable isotopes are interesting here because they're not saying, they're not just in full agreement with gut content. They're not like, oh, mice and mice and mice. They're saying, well, mice, but maybe a certain brand of mice, right? It's not all mice out there. And then finally, thank you uh, to, there's been a number of collaborators on this, and I know that I'm about to run out of time. So I will just say thank you to all the people that have worked on this, because there have been a lot of people doing this, and I'm just presenting some of that work now. So I don't take credit for having done all the back end uh, effort on this, only just getting it up here. So if you have any questions, do I even have? You got two minutes. Two minutes. So if I have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.